Holy and merciful God, we thank you that you have not left us to flounder with our own imaginations. You have not left us to grope in our hearts, but you have revealed your word. You have revealed the gospel of Jesus Christ through the scriptures. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our hearts this morning. We pray that you would grant strength and edification to your people. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring conviction and repentance and life if there is anyone here who is not a believer. Bless your word to us this day. We pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I've got a challenge for you this morning. I want you to find the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> and don't be intimidated. I had to look and check to make sure I was pronouncing it correctly myself. I had to look at one that broke up the name and put an accent so I'd get it in the right spot. The book of Habakkuk, which is in the Old Testament after the major prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Okay. I don't know if you all still do that. I had to memorize the books of the Old Testament when I was in vacation Bible school. We are going to look at two passages that will consist of four verses in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and then Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. So Habakkuk chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And now, if you will, turn over to chapter 3, the last three verses of the book. Beginning at verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The entire Bible teaches justification by faith through grace. All through the Old Testament, we see many examples of the sacrifices. And if you think about it, every time that priest put his hand on an animal and then cut it and shed its blood, that was God proclaiming that we are justified by faith through grace alone. Or think about the account of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac goes up, go up onto the mountain to do a sacrifice. And Isaac says, where's the sacrifice? We've got the fire, we've got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And I don't know, but I suspect he was beginning to get a little bit nervous at that point. And Abraham, by faith, says, the Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. And where Abraham did not have to kill his only begotten son, and it's an interesting thing in the text in Genesis, when God tells him to take his son, he says, take your son, your only begotten son. That's there in the text, in the Hebrew. 
Abraham did not have to sacrifice his only son, but God sacrificed his only begotten son. And that is a picture of the gospel of justification by faith. Of course, it's all through Paul's epistles as well. But also, I think another great example, think about the thief on the cross. The man who said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. What works did that thief have to offer? He did not even come to faith until he was dying. And yet, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise today. He was saved by faith through grace, through Jesus Christ. Well, one of the great examples in the Bible of justification by faith is this little known, too seldom read book, the book of Habakkuk. Let me give you a little bit of the context in which Habakkuk is preaching. At his t in his time, Assyria was the dominant empire in the world. And Assyria was the original evil empire. <laughs> they were cruel. They delighted in cruelty. Even their art celebrated cruelty. You go and look at Assyrian palaces and you see lions wounded and dying and dragging their corpses on the ground, their bodies on the ground. It was the Assyrians, folks, who invented crucifixion. That is how cruel they were. They were, when I teach my ancient classes, I, I like to tell them the Assyrians were the Nazis of the ancient Near East. And they were at the height of their power in Habakkuk's day, and yet much of the book of Habakkuk is, the Lord is going to take these people down. If you want to think of about a parallel, Imagine that it's July of 1940 and the Nazis have just overrun all of Western Europe and a Christian priest in Poland says, the Lord is going to take these guys down. That's, that's what, in effect, Habakkuk is doing here, despite the fact that they were the superpower of the day. Well, in Habakkuk, as he's talking through all of this, we get a very precious sentence in chapter 2, verse 4. One sentence, the just shall live by faith. And of course, you all know, Paul picks this up and he quotes this in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. That's what Paul is doing there. He's quoting Habakkuk. And perhaps you'll also remember famously that a German monk by the name of Martin Luther was studying the book of Romans. He had to give a series of lectures. He was a theologian and he was giving a series of lectures and he preached through this, lectured on this, he studied it and God brought the gospel to his heart. Martin Luther, who was already a theologian, realized finally the glorious truth that the just shall live by faith. And he was converted, and that's what launched the Protestant Reformation, was the truth of this gospel message. So I want us to reflect this morning on what this sentence means. The just shall live by faith. Here we have the heart of the gospel. Just refers to a person who is judged righteous by God. And make no mistake about it, the Bible is also very clear on this. God requires absolute, unconditional righteousness. God says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Several times in the Old Testament, God speaks to the Israelites and he says, you be holy as I am holy. That's the standard of righteousness that God sets. And of course the problem is that we lack it. But lest you think that's only an Old Testament thing, 
Think about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, where the writer to the Hebrews tells us, without holiness, no man shall see God. We have to have holiness if we shall see God. But we lack it. So how do we get the righteousness that God requires? Come back to that in a few minutes. Next two words, the just shall live. I think that this, pa that this verb, shall live, has two senses to it. In an absolute sense, it means to pass from death to life spiritually. To have this holiness that God requires. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So this sentence, the just shall live, is telling us that when God justifies us, when he declares us just, then we know him. We know who he is. We know him, and we know him as our father, not as a judge or an enemy, but we know him as our father. And we have eternal life. This is how we get life, is by knowing him. I want to suggest, however, and I think the second passage in Habakkuk speaks to this, so I'll come back to this a little bit later. There's another sense that, that that shall live bears. It refers, first of all, to receiving life in, in Christ, but it also refers to the experience. How do we walk out day to, by day the life that we have, the eternal life? How does a person whom God has justified live from day to day in this world? So we're going to look at two senses of shall live. Shall live, meaning entering into relationship with God, but also, how do we live our day-to-day -day life? How do you handle tomorrow? How do you handle the things in your life? And of course, the key phrase in this sentence is the last two words. The just shall live by faith. Here, through the prophet Habakkuk, God has revealed that we have justification by faith, not by our own performance. God does not accept you and me because we were sorry enough for our sins, because we repented seriously enough, or because we changed and began to live godly lives. Let alone, God does not accept us because we were baptized or became a member of the church, or take communion. God does not even accept us because of the quality of our faith. God accepts us because our faith is in Jesus Christ. It is the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, that saves us. And God accepts us, and he declares us righteous, only through faith, through resting on Jesus Christ's perfect obedience, which is imputed, which is simply a fancy way of saying put to our account, and also upon his death, when we rest upon his death, which pays in full that penalty for our sins. That is how we gain eternal life. And remember, Jesus has told us that eternal life is knowing God as our Father, by faith, receiving the free gift of Christ. But I want to say a little bit more about faith this morning because there is a lot of misunderstanding about that in the world around us. Faith is the empty mouth that feeds on Christ. It is the empty hand which is then filled by God's gift of the righteousness of Christ. This is how we live. Faith has to be an empty hand. If it's filled with anything other than Christ, 
then Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 2, Christ profits you nothing. When we try to add anything of our own to simple faith, when we try to fill our hand with anything else, we push out Christ. And God will not share His glory. So the only way to receive His gift of righteousness is with an empty hand, looking only to Jesus Christ for help. As I suggested a few minutes back, to live has two senses, I believe, in this passage. How we come into life, how we enter into eternal life by faith, but Habakkuk also declares what the experience of a life of faith looks like. And we see this in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Notice that in chapter 3, 17 through 19, the life of faith is not resting on what we see around us. We do not judge by outward appearance or circumstances. As our pastor told us last week, the life of faith in this world is a life under the cross. Habakkuk specifically gives us several examples. Notice he says in verse 17, the fig tree is not blossoming. Now this is especially easy for us to think about in this time of year. When you look out at trees this time of year, if you do not see any blossoms, if you do not see any buds this time of year, what that tells you is the tree is dead. There is no life there. And so there is an absence of the evidence of life. This is what we see with our eyes. There is also an absence of fruit. Notice he says, the vine has no fruit on it. And our labor, our work and our efforts fail. Notice, uh, though the labor of the olive may fail. One of the reasons I wanted to address this passage is because many of us in this church are experiencing life under the cross. Several people in here have already had to deal with the death of loved ones who are very dear to them. More than one parent has to contend, what about a, if I have a child who was raised as a covenant child and to all appearances there is no life? That child has turned away from the gospel and rejected the faith that we have tried so hard to bring to. Many of us have prayed. We've prayed for our loved ones to be healed and they died. We've prayed for circumstances and God's answer to all appearance is no. We know what that is. Or perhaps you've witnessed to people as I think back in my own life, I've had the privilege of witnessing to a large number of people. Very few of them seem to come to faith in Christ. The labor seems to be in vain. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but I will ask you to think about this. You know, have you ever been tempted to say, why should I keep on praying? It doesn't seem to matter. Or why should I keep on witnessing to that person that's lost. He seems so hard and resistant. Why should I continue with that child whose heart seems so hard and stony and we don't see evidence of life or fruit? Another thing that Habakkuk observes in the second half of verse 17, there's no food. The fields yield no food. There are no flocks. The flock may be cut off from the fold. There are no cattle. There is no herd in the stalls. Verse 
There is no visible means of support. And I suspect every person in this room probably knows what it feels like to think, I can't go on. I don't have the resources to go on. I can't continue to suffer that loss. I can't continue to do that work. I can't continue to witness to that person who is spurning Christ. And you're right. You don't have the resources. I don't have the resources. When we look with our eyes, Habakkuk, notice the realism of God's revelation. God doesn't give us a happy story. God gives us reality. And the reality is we don't have those resources. We can't bring life. We can't do anything as much as we would like to. But praise God, Habakkuk doesn't leave us there. The last verse, last two verses. Faith rejoices. The prophet declares that even in our present life under the cross, he's watching the Assyrians march in triumph all over the Near East, and seemingly no one can stop them. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And you say, Habakkuk, why? Why are you rejoicing in the Lord? And by the way, rejoicing in the Lord doesn't mean that you're not weeping. Amen. We rejoice through our tears, living under the cross. But we can rejoice because he tells us, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. Faith rests upon God's promises. God's faithfulness and God's ability, not ours. And because faith looks to God, even while we're weeping, even while we feel the pain and the frustration and the terror, we can rejoice and live in joy, whatever our present circumstances look like. I want to make a point here, too. This is not a leap of faith. This is not simply a power of positive thinking. There are a lot of people out there that have a phony gospel and just say, think positively, it's all going to be okay. Our faith is not in the strength of faith, and our faith is not in positive thinking. Our faith is in the character of God, who He is. And our faith is grounded in His revelation. We have His Word. It's not your confidence or my confidence. It's because God is faithful to His Word. And finally, the Scriptures are very clear on this. We can rejoice even in the sorrows and defeats and failures because of what God has already done. Think about what the writer to the Hebrews tells us about the example of Jesus Christ, who lived by faith during his crucifixion. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the writer says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus had a promise from God. Jesus had a promise that God would give him the church. And he trusted that promise while he was bleeding his life out on the cross. And think about it. Think about Jesus' words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Don't think that Jesus didn't know. The utter devastation the agony of separation from God in his humanness. And yet, the writer tells us, he kept his eyes on the joy that was set before him and he endured that cross, despising the shame. I got curious about that this morning and I looked it up. 
And the word literally means his mind looking down upon, scorning the shame. There was shame on that cross and Jesus experienced it. But Jesus scorned that because he trusted God. Because he had the promise of God. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the writer to the Hebrews says, look to Jesus' example. You don't get down off of the cross. We live under the cross in this world. But Jesus Christ endured that shame, endured that agony, because he believed in God's promise, the joy that was set before him. And that is what the scriptures call us to live in a life of faith. Jesus trusted God's promises, think about it, through death and hell. And we are encouraged by the scriptures to do the same thing. And our encouragement is a promise that he makes. I'm going to paraphrase it. Romans chapter 8, I trust you all know this and it's familiar to you. The apostle writes, God who did not spare his own son for us, how will he withhold anything else that is for our good? Yes. Living by faith means that we trust God's promises and his goodness towards us because of who he is and because of what he has already done for us in Jesus Christ. Well, perhaps there's somebody here who has not trusted in Jesus Christ. What is this passage in Habakkuk saying to you? It's saying you are not alive. If you do not know God as your Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, you are not alive. And you are not alive because you do not have faith. That is how we receive life. And it also tells us you do not have the holiness that God requires. Instead, you are facing the judgment of God, an angry God who is offended by your sin. But please hear me. The prophet here is not telling you this simply to condemn you. The prophet is telling you this to call you to believe. Put your faith in Christ so that you may have life and so that you may have Christ's holiness given to you. God is not willing that any should perish. And because of that, he calls you this morning and commands you to turn to him in repentance and faith. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, won't you turn to Christ and embrace him by faith? But if you're a believer, then the prophet's message to you is live by faith. Do not be undone by your circumstances, by death, by your defeats and your failures. Live by faith. Trust his promises. Trust that God is for you in Christ and continue to live under the cross, whatever your cross is in your life. Continue to live under that cross and wait patiently for the glorious vindication that will come when Jesus Christ is revealed at the end. Amen. Amen.